So welcome everyone to my panel, Wonders of World Building. I'm thrilled to be here in Germany and ready to guide you on your writing paths. So allow me to introduce myself first so that I'm not some random guy telling you what to do and what not to do. Hi, my name is Elkia. I like learning languages, writing stories, teaching, and making memes. And in the future, I want to become a professor in English. Hello, my name is Elkia. Ik hou van talen leren, verhalen schrijven, memes maken en onderwijzen. En in de toekomst wil ik graag een Engels professor worden. Hallo, mijn naam is Elkia. Ik lief sprachen te lernen, geschichten te schrijven, te onderrichten en memes te maken. En in de toekomst möchte ik gerne een Engels professor worden. Hi, hi. Jij heet er Elkia. Je liet er al alle spraak, als schrijven eventier, al onderwijzen, ook al lage memes. In vreemdtijden wil jij waren een Engels professor. Waren een Engels professor. So yes, I really, really like languages. And I also like doing panels. Because this panel, Wonders of World Building, is actually the fifth panel I have done. And on the screen you can see the other panels at the other conventions. My first one was called Elkia's Creative Writing Panel, which I held at Galacon 2017 in this very room. So yes, history does repeat itself. And this was kind of a Writing 101 course, which I gave. The second one, Get It Right, at UK PonyCon 2017, was about creating a plot for your story. No, not that kind of plot. You know what I mean. Um, the one after that, Get In Character, at Hearts Warming Con 2018, was all about creating characters for your story. And the panel before this one was a very special panel named Panelicious. And it was special because it had nothing to do with writing stories, but with creating panels. But right now I am here in Germany and together we are going to make miracles happen and create a world of our very own. So you can do with it whatever you want. Colonize it, destroy it. Sure, it's your story. A small note up front, the tips and tricks I am going to give you right now are by no means rules. Every pony has a different way to write. And I present this way because um, I think it's a very fun way and it might help you as well. Please do not think that I am some kind of almighty God person who does everything right the first time. If you can find a faster or better way to build a world, then by all means do what you want. Always do things the best way. And if you don't know what's best and cannot find out what is best, then do what feels right. With that said, are you ready to build a world? Very good. Then let us begin. It's always useful to know what you are doing before you are actually doing it. So let's take a look at what world building actually is. With world building, you are creating a story world for your story. And a story world is one of the three essential elements you need when you want to write a story, together with characters and plot. It's always a good thing to... Um, no, uh, imagine, a war, um, imagine a story without characters. That would be a nature documentary. And a story without a plot would be a random collection of things that happen which have nothing to do with one another. And a story without a story world would simply be a conversation between two floating heads in endless nothingness. You need a stage for your players to perform on and make your plot unfold. It's always useful to think about your story world quite a bit before you even start hammering your keyboard. Because sometimes the world determines what kind of story you can write. A story world gives options, but also restrictions. In a world made out of paper, you cannot make your character smile and dance in the rain. 
because one shower of rain would make the whole world sag and fall apart. So rain would be disastrous for your paper world and not one character could ever be happy to see storm clouds approach. But what you can do in your paper world is create amazing buildings. Because it is very easy to fold paper into all kinds of cool shapes which might be used in construction. It's also useful to know how you can get something done before actually doing it. If you've seen my YouTube video, The Basics of World Building, this next part will be very, very familiar to you. But of course, I will dive much deeper into this method right now because, uh, and use pony examples because all ponies are best ponies and all ponies are equal. The essential guideline is to question your world. For example, by using the what if question. Together with geographical dimensions. And geographical dimensions sounds very complicated, but that is just because I want to sound intelligent and sophisticated. So let me show you what these geographical dimensions are exactly. The physical geographical dimension is about uh, the natural order of your world. I'm talking about the plants and the animals, um, but also the elements, water, earth, fire and air. It's about the way the terrain looks, like mountains or oceans, the climate, like deserts and tropical rainforest, and don't forget the weather, my dear Pegasi. The cultural dimension is about the dominant intelligent species of your world. In our own world, those are humans. And in Equestria, those are ponies, yaks, dragons, changelings, and all the other races. These um, intelligent species create things like art, literature, music, fashion, technology. Um, of course, they also speak different languages, celebrate different occasions, eat all kinds of food, and might even believe in one or more gods. And of course, your um, people or ponies will behave in a certain way which they find acceptable. In Equestria, it is acceptable not to wear any clothes. While in our world that is acceptable in some places and communities. The demographic dimension, uh, you can think about the age of your population, race and ethnicity, and how the people or ponies are spread out of your world. The economic dimension is easy. It's about everything regarding money, business and trade. My favorite one is the political dimension, because the political, um, the political system of your world can influence all the other dimensions, the other geographical dimensions, very much. Are you, go are you going for open, free, American-style capitalism, total anarchy, or a totalitarian state in the signature style of Starlight Glimmer? It's all. Your choice. War and peace are also matters of politics, more often than not. The magical dimension is something I made up, because you will not find it in any normal geography textbook, obviously. Still, it's very fun to use, and also very important if you are writing a My Little Pony fanfiction. The world of Equestria is filled with magic, and the show isn't called Friendship is Magic, for nothing. Think about spells, rituals, different kinds of powers, the source of magic, who can do magic and who can't, and of course, how society reacts to the use of magic. The historical dimension blurs the line between history, geography, and backstory. The way your world looks is a direct result of everything that has happened before. Is your world young or old? Just created from magma or weathered for eons by the elements? Are your people or ponies primitive or have they had a long history of development and evolution? Have they perfected the recipe for cider in the passing years? Very important. 
Now let's see some what if questions together with these geographical dimensions. What if the world were made out of candy? What if ponies worshipped dragons? What if Starlight Glimmer waged war in Equestria, won, and established a totalitarian state? That's not my fault. It really isn't. It works in PowerPoint. No excuses, no regrets. All right, and now it's time to ask ourselves some what if questions. Raise your hoof if you have an idea, no matter how scary or cool or weird, it, or funny, of course, anything goes. And we will use the challenge sheet for that, which I made over here. Cool. So we will start our sentences with what if, and we will also start with the physical geographical dimension. Natural order, elements, terrain, climate, weather. Who has an idea? Tell me. Uh, what, if the, what if the ponies knew that in 10 years the world is going to be flooded? Whoa. What if the ponies knew that in 10 years the world will be flooded? That's very apocalyptic. Cool. Yeah, yeah, in Germany you actually have different keyboards than in the Netherlands. So it's a bit. It's the one key that doesn't work. You have to use the one on the right side. Oh, really? Oh, okay. It sounds like a challenge. <laughs> yeah. Now that kills the suspense. Cool. I'm getting a bit of a biblical vibe out of this. Cultural dimension, anything that has to do with what people or ponies make. Is that, a, yeah? Tell me. To go with the first question, what if there were no sea ponies? What if there were no sea ponies? Um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah, I think that is actually one for the demographic dimension because that has to do with the population of your world. Yeah. That's all right. We're working ahead here. Cool. So cultural dimension, we're still at the cultural dimension. Dominant intention species, art, literature, music, etc., etc. Tell me. What if ponies worship man itself and so unicorns become an upper class? Okay, so if ponies worshipped magic itself and the unicorns become an upper class. Class of priestesses or something. Yeah, yeah. I like this. So now we also have a little bit of a crossover to the magical dimension and the political dimension, perhaps. It's already starting to overlap. It's really cool. The more you work at it, and the more details you think of, the more you will see it will start to overlap. It's really magical. Economic dimension, money, business, trade. What do we have? What do these ponies use as money? Tell me. What if a great heat wave uh, made it difficult for ponies to get water and so Yak Yakistan could hot the water to a question? Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's hot. It's hard to get water and Yak Yakistan will become perhaps a, a very rich trading center for water if they can melt the ice and stuff. So I'll just um, type in water as currency. Or something like this. <coughs> Political dimension, what system do we have? Tell me, mister. Uh, I, uh, 
Okay. Um, well, we're now at the political dimension, right? Tell me. Okay, so now Celestia will be the grand dictator, I see. Cool. What is that then? All hail Trollestia? Oh, perhaps. Yeah, it's a terrible thing, dictatorships, but it's so interesting. <laughs> Magical dimension. What do we do with equestrian magic? Mr. in the back, tell me. Uh, magic was spells, but uh, rituals. With rituals, with ingredients and great preparations. Okay, so there are no spells, but you need ingredients. Mm -hmm. Is that what you say? Yes, potion magic. Potion magic, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, so potion magic will be very powerful. So Sakura will have a great time in this world. <laughs> Why? Cool. Historical dimension, now we're looking into the past. What great thing might have happened? Tell me. What if uh, uh, Oliver wanted to succeed and become another state? Uh, what if it just happened in the past? They wanted to what? Recombine? You mean like form one big state, one big country? Or? Yeah? Okay, cool. So Ponyville has a history of unity, wanting to become one with the rest of Equestria, maybe even the center of the world. Ooh. <laughs> Uh, I don't know much about the past, uh, about the previous generations, I'm afraid. Because Polyville was founded earlier and became this. Because uh, Rajiv was uh, generally uh, beautiful. Oops. Do we use American spelling? Yeah, why not? Nice. Now we have all of them. We have all of our what if questions. There we go. It still works. Nice. Another great world building technique you can use is the why question. And with the why question, you are essentially working backwards. And it's great to use if you already have some ideas. You are working more with backstory. The trick is to start your sentence with why. Why is the world made out of candy? Because Discord reshaped it as he saw fit. Why do ponies worship dragons? Because every pony secretly wants to be one. Uh, where is it? Why did Starlight Glimmer wage war and establish a totalitarian equal state? Because she is secretly still evil. And as you can see, this technique is very simple, yet very effective. The only things you need are your own imagination and weirdness. And now is the perfect time to ask ourselves some why questions, because we just created our very own examples a few minutes ago. Let's see how far we will get in deepening our story world. Once again, raise your hoof if you have an idea. And it doesn't matter if you want to pose a why question to somebody else's what if question. We will just call it a collaboration then, and no piracy. Moving to the top, there we go. All right, so in 10 years, the world will be flooded in an apocalyptic deluge of pure madness. Why? Why does this happen? Tell me. Um, honestly, if I was going to write a story, I would, I would ask you not answer that question. Nobody knows. Okay, 
Yeah, then you are creating some mystery. Okay, can we use that? In 10 years it will be flood, why? Because it's a mystery, yeah. But for the sake of the example, let's try and explain this, but I'll put mystery there as well. Tell me, I collaboration time. I would answer the question in a way that I don't tell it in the story, but for me that I know how to progress the plot. And because of the other question with uh, Yagekistan, I would say because all the eyes in Yagekistan supplemented into the atmosphere. Okay. So all the eyes supplemented in the atmosphere. So it like it evaporated, and then there will be a huge rainstorm or something. Okay. Yeah, you can you can ask why indefinitely if you want, but we'll just do one step at a time for the sake of the example. I have no idea if this works actually, but if it doesn't work, magic. Cool. So it slowly evaporates, and it's a secret. But maybe only the yaks know, and they deliberately keep it a secret. Hoo hoo. Yeah, and that's what I said. If you, if you can find an alternative way to build a world, then go for it. Sometimes you have to. Uh, Invent your own method. Cool. Next one. Ponies worship magic and unicorns become an upper class. And why is that? Tell me. Because it wasn't the joy and love of ponies who go away the windigos, but the unicorn's magic. All right. So there was no hope and love to begin with. Just magic. Cool. We are right now. We are completely reinventing the canon of uh, My Little Pony. Do you see that? All right. Demographic. Why are there no sea ponies? This is a very open question. You can you can think up all kinds of things with this one. Um, in the blue T-shirt. Tell me. Okay, so they made a final decision to leave the water and live the rest of their lives forever as hippogriffs in the sky. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. They, they've, they've got an amulet, right? Okay, not too much because I only have one hand to write. <laughs> uh, what did we say? Yeah, they decided. How do you write hippogriffs? <laughs> like hippo, two Ps, two Fs, like this. Yeah, okay. Awesome. I'm learning so much today. Do you see that? Cool. Um, why do ponies trade in water? Yeah, because the, um, the, the ice cap is melting, of course. But maybe we can find another reason why ponies trade in water. Oh, yeah, yeah, the heat wave. That was it, yeah. Yes, of course, yeah. Thank you. Heat wave. It's already so warm. Why do you say something like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I asked. <laughs> Political dimension. Why will Princess Trollestia become a dictator? Will she be crazy or corrupted in some way? Tell me. <laughs> Whoa. 
<laughs> okay, she is secretly Starlight Lima. So, what was the last thing you said? Who traveled back into the past and? Shape shifted. Okay, cool. Wow. Stella Glimmer is getting a bit Mary Sue ish. Do you see? <laughs> okay. Awesome. This is getting so complicated. <laughs> I'm not going to write this. What if magic um, could only be used as potions? Why is that? Mr. in the back, tell me. Because the only ones didn't want anyone else to have magic and broke the magic. Okay, so they became mad with power. They wanted to hide their magic, keep it all for themselves, and accidentally broke it. So now this, potions, is the only way any pony can ever do magic again. Cool. So unicorns broke the magic, and I'll put greed in there. Ponyville, in the past, was founded first and wanted to be a center of the world. So why was it founded first? I think it's because the canon says that the winning ghosts were defeated there. But maybe we can find some other reason why it was founded first. Tell me. Yeah. And that's what kind of happened with Pony World. So they maybe founded the Pony World together. Like yeah. Kind of and reminder of their unity. Yeah, okay. So there was a great danger. And the different races decided to unite and gather at in, in Ponyville. So it essentially became a symbol of their unity and the center of Equestria. Cool. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Cool, we've got all the why questions. You can build on these questions, as we have already done, using another technique, the rule of cause and effect. And this rule dictates, dictates that if one thing happens, another thing happens as a consequence. And it is a way to explain backstory. Um, uh, sorry, it's a way to predict the future or to explain backstory, depending on how you decide to use this technique. You might, ev if you use it to predict the future, you might even end up with a possible plotline for your story. The trick is to start your sentences with the word if. And try to go as far as you can, because the better you can establish a cause and effect relationship, the more details you can uncover about your world. Now you need not only imagination and weirdness, but also a tiny bit of logic, or else your world will make no sense. Although Pinkie Pie would probably disagree. Discord as well, yeah. Uh, yeah, take a look at the following examples and notice how the different geographical dimensions start to influence one another. The colors I use correspond to the different geographical dimensions. <laughs> if the world were made out of candy, then ponies would probably not be able to grow any normal crops and eat only sweetness day in, day out. Needless to say, the population will become very unhealthy because of the sugar overdose every day. If ponies worship dragons, these dragons could then rise to power 
and become the new leaders of Equestria. And then burping might actually become an official greeting. If Starlight Glimmer were to become a dictator again, then Equestria would finally have a capable leader. Nah, no, just kidding. If Starlight Glimmer were to become a dictator, Equestrian culture will be radically transformed. Old celebrations will be abolished. And every pony will be forced to celebrate the day the great leader rid them of all the pretty princesses. Maybe she will even introduce communism as the economic status quo. Because why not? It fits it perfectly. Someday, yeah. Uh, so you have seen how this technique works, and let's use this one ourselves, shall we? This is perhaps the most difficult challenge of them all, because these cause and effect relationships require an open mind. But I know you can do it. You're already doing very well. Let's see how far we will get in creating these kinds of relationships. Under the watchful gaze of another beautiful piece of propaganda, bonified. Cool. If ponies knew that in 10 years there will be a disastrous flood, then what? What will they do? Will there be panic? Will they prepare themselves? What will happen? Mister, with the Luna shirt, tell me. Sorry, they will try to buy what? Build ours. Oh, all right. We are getting really biblical here. <laughs> they are going to build arcs to save every pony in the world. Well, two of every pony, of course. But that would be difficult. Like two Earth ponies, two unicorns, and two Pegasi. Wow. <laughs> that, that is dramatic. Wow. Cool. And two bad ponies. And, and two what? Yeah, two bad ponies, two changelings, etc., etc. Uh, arcs with a K, right? Yeah. Just like in Dutch. Cool. So they will build arcs. And actually, I've spoiled it already because they will have some kind of selection procedure. But I'm actually cheating. So let's, let's figure out something else or build on this idea. Tell me. Cool. They will try to build artificial islands, perhaps even tie all the arcs together to create these islands. Oh, yeah. So the reptile will still have to be. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember the Crystal Empire and the Crystal Empire of the Crystal Empire? Yeah. So maybe that. Yeah, perhaps. They might use magic as well. Um, yeah, I'm getting. The, so at first it was very biblical, and now I'm getting. Um, what was the name of the movie again? Waterworld. That's it. I'm getting Waterworld vibes. Awesome. We're combining all kinds of things here. <laughs> this is the ultimate crossover between MLP, the Bible, and Waterworld. <laughs> yeah. Cool. <coughs> so, ponies worship magic, and therefore unicorns are the upper class now. And then what? What will happen? Tell me. The top ponies would become the lowest class because they can choose any. Ooh, that's a dangerous thing to say for everyone who has an Earth Pony OC. But yeah, well, I like, I really like controversial things, so we'll go with that. I like it. Applejack will not be happy about that. <laughs> cool. Oh. OK, never mind the spelling, I'm sorry. We're going for speed here. Then Earth ponies will become the lowest class. And then what? Riots? Slavery? Ooh, that's dark. Tell me, Mr. with the beard. Uh, 
poor. They will use, the earth ponies, being the lowest class, will use, some, uh, will use technology to create magic of their own. Cool. Actually, actually, maybe shamanism might work. You know what, what Sakura does and stuff. But technology might be cool too. <coughs> they create magic with techno music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Germany and techno, you know. Right. There are no more sea ponies. So then what? Tell me. Okay. Uh, but do sea ponies control the weather? Okay, cool. Maybe they want to, maybe the sea ponies can control like the tides, you know, waves and stuff and tsunamis and all kinds of nasty things. And the other races will try to emulate that. So in any way, the other races will try to gain some control over the weather in the absence of the sea ponies. They will rival over no weather control. All right, they will rival over weather control. We are having some great conflict again. Cool. So then what? There's a great rivalry to control the tides and the power of the water. What then? Civil war? Cooperation? Alliances? Tell me. Okay, the earth ponies join the hippogriffs because they control the weather much better. Cool. So that's an alliance. Earth ponies and hippogriffs versus pegasi, you know? Cool. <coughs> the earth ponies join the hippos. Ponies will trade in water. And then what? What kind of economy will this be? How do you trade in water? Barrels? Do you freeze it? Do you, yeah, tell me. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So yaks will actually travel all over Equestria just to trade. So they might become very worldwide. Cool. So these yaks, they travel and they trade and they go all over Equestria. And what will happen with these yaks? Will they still be angry, annoying perfectionists? Who knows? Tell me, sir. Wow, oh that's cool. Yes, of course, because ice isn't the only source of water. Rain is a source of water as well. Yeah, yeah. So they, they might exploit the Pegasi then. Ooh, that's a dangerous game. How do you call this then? Like a cow yak? It's like a, a Pegasi yak? Yeah, yeah, but I still like the idea of like them completely controlling them. Yeah, Jakus, who said that? Awesome. Cool. Trelestia will be a dictator because the Starlight Glimmer traveled to the past and then shapeshifted. So what will happen when Trelestia is the great uh, dictator? Mr. Fluttershy, tell me. Everyone will be equal. 
Yes, imagine that. I mean, Celestia is so powerful. She might even be able to use her magic and literally make every pony powerless and equal, which is a great thing. Awesome. Then what? Every pony is powerless and every pony is equal. Then what? Tell me. Oh, wow. We're weaving everything together right now. All right. So they will decide to use the potions. And they have to do something, right? Cool. Now we arrive at the magical dimension. Magic can only be used by using potions. And then what? I think Sakura will do great business, actually. <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Pinky. Frankly, I'm to what I wanted to say. The zebra will get much more influence because they have so much knowledge about potions and everything. So they always meet them to teach them what, uh, what to do. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So every pony will go to a zebra school to learn the art of potion making. Then I know who will be head of class. <laughs> Apple Bloom. Z. <laughs> Whoppa. <coughs> the zebras will have schools and every pony will be eager to learn the art of potion making. So what will happen then? Will the schools be very crowded and very valuable? Yes, tell me. Okay, oh, wow. So things will get really crazy and really out of control maybe as we will get a new race of hybrid earth ponies, pegasi, unicorns and zebras. Okay, might make for a great OC. <laughs> yeah, 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 flying yak, yeah. Pony Befeel was founded first, then what? And right now we are deep into the past. So remember that as context. Tell me. Then Pony will be an independent city state because Questure has not this equal. Um, because Questure worships, uh, puts unicorns on a, on, a, on a higher level than the other species. Uh, okay. Yes, oh. uh, that's okay. Yes. And if we combine that, then Tonyville should, should be an independent city state to yep. request here because these two don't mix. Okay, yeah. So they will become an independent city state when every pony is powerless and equal. That's it, right? Okay. Let's go with that. Oh. <laughs> Maybe. Cool. Then what? They are an independent city state. Tell me, Mr. Auf Deutsch? <coughs> ah, 
Ah, trading will become very profitable. Yes, of course, makes sense. I mean, Rome was also the center of the world and it was also very profitable. Nice. We have so many things now, oops. There we go, propaganda. Mm -mm. When creating your own world, also a thing you must do is determine the scale level of your world. If you study geography and opened an atlas, you can see many different maps on many different scale levels on it. You have maps of the world, of a part of the world, of countries, regions, states, provinces, cities, and even certain neighborhoods. And certain kinds of stories work best with certain kinds of scale levels. I mean, Star Wars might have been a very boring saga if the story played out on just one single planet. And Titanic would have made no sense if the story took place both on board the ship and a few countries on land. When I determine scale level, I use these different levels to zoom in and out to determine what scale I need, um, yeah, to determine the scale I need for my stories. The universal level instantly makes you recall Star Trek and Star Wars and all the other space travel science fiction series. Fantasy too uses different realms like Azeroth and the Outland from the World of Warcraft video games. Maybe you've heard of it? This is the highest scale level where you will use different planets, solar systems, and maybe even dimensions. What you can also do is uh, only hint, uh, is let the story play out on one planet and only hint at the existence of extraterrestrials in legends and backstory. That is what horror, science fiction horror writer H.P. Lovecraft likes to do in his Cthulhu Mythos Tales. The horror, the horror. The global level is simply one planet. Enough said. The regional level is a bit more vague. In our own world you have regions as big as cities or as large as different countries. A region can be a group of cities, like um, a group of countries, like Scandinavia, a group of provinces or states, like New England in America, a group of cities, or just a region where certain flora and fauna lives and where certain activities happen, like das Ruhrgebiet in Germany. National level is also very simple, just one country. The rural urban level means the different villages and uh, cities, because rural means countryside and urban means cities. I'm talking about all the villages, even the cutest and tiniest ones, and the grand cities where innovation happens. There is an even smaller scale level called the domestic scale level. And in this scale level, the story takes place in one single house or sometimes in one single room. For example, my own story, Don't Do It, takes place in a single room, but that is actually more of a one-shot and not really a story or a book. So yes, you can use this itsy bitsy tiny scale level, but beware that your story might then be on the shorter and simpler side of fiction. But if that is exactly what you want, then go for it. Also very nice and very useful to make is a map. Especially if you are writing a very large book with many different story threads and different characters in different cities. Maps make it easy to track who is where and what happens where and might also be used to get a feeling of distance and travel time. If you are an amazing graphic artist, you might even publish your map together with your book. But if you are like me and cannot even draw a stick figure properly, then your map will look a bit more schematic and useful only for yourself and not for promotion. And that's alright too. Now 
Nordic mythology and runology are also two hobbies of mine. And these were kind of the things that kindled my fascination for anything Norwegian, including the Norwegian language. The ancient Vikings believed in nine different worlds held together by the world tree Yggdrasil in the great nothingness. And notice that some of these worlds are opposite of each other. For example, Asgard on top, the realm of the gods, and Jotunheim to the right, uh, yeah, bottom right, which is the world of the giants, their arch rivals. But there is also the rainbow bridge in the middle, which connects Asgard with Midgard, which is our own world we call Earth. And the Nine Worlds is a great world with lots of opportunity for conflict. And conflict is exactly what you want if you are writing your own story. This map is not just made to show where the worlds are, but also reveals some folklore of the ancient Nordic world. For example, the chariots Sul and Mani, which carry the sun and the moon. Celestia might be able to learn something from that. I don't think I will have to explain that much about this world now, do I? Trust me when I say that you will use this world many, uh, you will use this map many, many times when you are writing your own MLP adventure style fan fiction. You can see all the different settlements like Ponyville and Cantalot in the middle, the different climate zones as well, polar climate in the north, and down south we have desert and tropical rainforest. So the equator would be somewhere over here in the south. Opposites of each other are the Dragonlands, Griffinstone and Yakyakistan, where conflict might arise. Connections are the railroads and of course the harbors at the coast. So what scale level is this map on? Can anyone tell me that? Yes? It's not totally global, but I would still say it's global. Global, yeah, that's it, yeah. This, my dear audience, is the reason why I am a writer and not an artist. Still, it was the only example of this scale level I could easily come by. This is a map of the Horseshoe Fjord, uh, out of my own story, A Cold Tale Up North. Um, it is a place where the main six and Sleipnir, yes, the same Sleipnir as the horse from Nordic mythology, will travel to, to save it from a terrifying storm. It's a story I've been working on since the beginning of my writing career, three and a half years ago. And it's still not finished. <laughs> Although I have finished the first two books right now. It will be a four book epic. So you can already see why this world is called the Horseshoe Fjord. It's a fjord shaped like a horseshoe, which tells us something about the historical dimension and the physical geographical dimension. The red dots are the pony settlements, and the bubbles are different places where different creatures live. This one, this one, and the one on top. And there is a lot of conflict in this world, which shows through the overlap of the elk and wolf territories. You don't have to be a biologist to know that elks and wolves do not mix. Um, also, the mountain range is infested with wolves as the war rages on. And thanks to this mountain range, the uh, different settlements are quite isolated, but there are some connections as well. For example, the place where the fjord meets the ocean, and look over here. Might that be a secret passage through the mountains? Who knows, who knows? So what scale level is this map? Who has an idea? Tell me. It's not national. This is a place in Equestria. Yeah? Regional, yes, indeed. The Horseshoe Fjord is a region with the tundra on top and all the way up north, the frozen wastes where no pony can ever live. Right? Whoa. What the hey is this? 
This might look like some very strange abstract painting, but this is actually a map. This is a map. Um, yeah, those of you who live in a big city might be able to read it at first sight. And those of you who live in Moscow can read it even faster. Because this is a map of the Moscow metro system, out of my favorite dystopian book ever, Metro 2033, written by Dmitry Glukovsky. The book is about a third world war, which forces the population of Moscow to hide into the metro. And they survived and turned every station into its own city-state, with its own political system and alliances. As you can see, we definitely lead a legend to decipher this map. Luckily, we have one right over here, and it's in German. The large, in a nutshell, the largest political powers are the communists on the red line, the capitalists on the circle line, and the fascists in the heart of the metro over there. And all these different visions on how the world, sh uh, how the metro should be, creates an enormous amount of tension, and a few bloody woes have already been fought between the stations. The connections are, of course, the tunnels, the railroads, and the very important Circle Line, which opens up trading possibilities for the entire metro. So what scale level would this strange map be? Yes, tell me. Rural. Rural. Almost, almost. It's the opposite. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the people in the metro call it a world. This is actually the urban level, because Moscow is a city, and rural means the countryside. So, almost. You get marks for effort, though. Mm -hmm. So, we have worked very hard to create our own story world. And it is already getting very detailed, isn't it? More detailed than I would, than I had expected, actually. <laughs> and that's a great thing, because the more you know about your story world, the more realistic your story will be, and the easier it will be to write your story. Doing a lot of research is a great cure for the dreaded writer's block. Only be careful not to use too much info in your story, because your reader is not reading a geography textbook. Use only the information you need to explain your world at the present moment in your story, either to your reader or to your characters. And I call that information on a need-to-know basis. And if you need to explain a lot about your world, you can write a short prologue. A short prologue, please. Or sprinkle the information through your dialogue. What you can also do is use epistolary interludes, like diary entries, which are used a lot in Fallout Equestria, and um, wall carvings to explain history and backstory. That is what H.P. Lovecraft likes to do in his Cthulhu Mythos Tales, in almost every story. <laughs> also a fun thing to do is create mystery, which we already covered a little bit. Maybe no one in your story world knows how the world works, or how it came to existence. And you can reveal some secrets bit by bit, as the plot progresses and the characters become wiser. Also, your reader will ask him or herself questions, so he or she will stay engaged and wants to read on and on and on, curious about your story world. If the story you are going to write is your first one ever, it might be a good idea to make your story world at least somewhat similar to our own Earth. That way you don't have to bother with creating all kinds of exotic climatological developments or outlandish races with complicated magical powers. When writing your first story, keep it simple. Keep as many options open as you can and write about what you know.
my work and where to find it, or shameless self-promotion galore. Always my favorite thing to do. If you want to have some more information about world building or writing in general, you can read Elkia's wonderful writing book and Elkia's awesome editions uh, on equestriadaily.com. They are hidden under the community tutorials tab. Or if you just can't get enough of the sound of my voice, you can always watch my YouTube video, The Basics of World Building, on the Elkia Daling YouTube channel. And do not expect a lot of content on that channel, because the video was actually just a one-time thing. It's an interesting story, really. Uh, I had to make one as a test to get admitted into the Hogeschool van Amsterdam, where I will be doing an English teacher study. And I'm very excited to begin. Also, this panel will be recorded, is already recorded, and will be posted on the Galacon YouTube channel. Am I right? Yeah. Great. So you can literally watch it again if you want. The footage of my first panel, Elkia's Creative Writing Panel, is on there as well. So if you click on that video, you can see how different I looked and laugh at how nervous I was at that time. <laughs> On my Fim Fiction page, you can find all the panels I have done. That's right, everyone. I post the complete panel scripts of all the panels I have done, including this one, on Fim Fiction. I use the blogs section to publish those. So if you want to take it all in a second time or gain inspiration by doing the challenges again or by yourself, feel free to do so. Of course, you can also find various stories on my film fiction page. Funny ones, sad ones, short ones, weird ones, and even three complete books if you're a fan of long stories. But wait, there is more. I post my outlines, my character sketches, and other pre-writing material as blog posts. And these are part of a making of series, which you can read if you are interested in finding out the practical process behind writing. And yeah, you might learn a lot from these making of blog posts. Of course, you can always at any time send me an email at elkiadeerling at gmail.com. I check my inbox every day. And before you are going to write this all down, you can also grab a card over here. Yeah, getting professional now with business cards. And my little Elkia plushie was supposed to be holding them, but sadly he couldn't be here. I'll send you regards if you want. Actually, I'm already over time, so I'm not sure if I have time for the q and I'm looking at the volunteers right now. Five minutes. Is there another panel? After this one, yeah. Five minutes. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, sure. Let's see how far we will get. So we will do the Q and A. And remember that there is no such thing as a stupid question, Phillies and gentle colts. The only thing that is stupid is not asking what you want to know. Perhaps there is you face struggles every time you want to write a story. Maybe you have a personal question for me, or you want to share a story idea, or of course, the ultimate MLP meme. Are we going to fix the paradox in the document? I'm not sure. I think. We have the equality of all, of all ponies under the uh, uh, Trollestia's rule, and we have the worship of all the ponies under the Trollestia's rule, and we have the worship of the magic and the. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I, I, I thought of these um, different exercises, um, challenges, as uh, separate things, actually. But yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I will definitely post the challenge sheet on um, my blog post section as well, so you can watch it again and laugh at what ridiculous things we, <laughs> we thought of. So yeah, maybe I will, maybe I won't. It, it's going to be a very difficult story if I'm actually going to write it, so I'm not sure.
The misguided narrator. Yeah, that's a very advanced thing to do, the misguided narrator. Then I mean, uh, you mean the unreliable narrator then? Yeah, that's it, yeah. So an unreliable narrator is when you um, use a perspective to tell your story, but the person who is telling the story, usually an I person, like I thought this and this, I did this and that, I knew this and this, um, might not tell the truth to the reader. That is called the unreliable narrator, and that is very difficult to do. And actually, I have not yet done it, the unreliable narrator. But I think the trick is subtlety. Be very subtle in that. Do not tell the biggest lies at the beginning, because then it's obvious that the narrator is unreliable. So rather, lie about just a few things and make it worse and bigger towards the end. For example, that in the end, the narrator might say, he lives, but actually he dies. That's a huge thing. That's a big lie to tell. And you'd best do that at the end, if you want to use the unreliable narrator um, narration technique. Is that a good idea? Yeah? Cool. Next question. Mr. in the back. Uh, you said something about the short prologue. Yeah, that's it. The, uh, the length, is it compared to the chapter length, or do you have a certain block length? Uh, yeah, yeah I, I was kind of act, acting ridiculous, but because of course you should do as you want, you should do as you wish. But the thing is, with prologues, they tend to get boring very quickly, because there are usually no characters, and there is usually not a lot of action. It's just the writer telling what happens. Take a look at the Follett Equestria prologue. It's like, it's like this, it's like one paragraph. And that's all you need. The rest is mystery. You will find the rest out on the go, as a reader. So yes, you can make it as long as you want, but try to make it as short as you can. That's a good idea. So let's say one page tops. Is that a good idea? Okay, cool. Another question, maybe? A comment. Comments are always appreciated on film fiction. <laughs> yes, Mr. Rainbow Jacket. I do have a question, but I'm not sure how to ask it. But like I said with my what if story with Starlight Women. Yeah. Um, what if the character of Starlight Women There are ponies that are on her side, and they're called, um, that that's called the equal state of the equal sphere. Yeah. But the ponies who are not on her side, that's called the equal sphere, as in free equal Yeah, yes, of course. So you get these two countries, two factions, yeah? This is kind of like uh, East and West Berlin, in a way. Ooh, okay. So, um, I have an idea where there could be like a final stand up. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a difficult thing, isn't it? Um, Death and My Little Pony, yeah. There's one episode which played with that... Um, two episodes which played with that theme. The episode with Philomena, who died, and Fletcher was devastated about that, but then got reborn. That's one. And also the episode... Um, it's the end of the episode, uh, where the apple lies, where you see two stars twinkle in the sky, as in Apple Chick's parents died. You know, so there's two instances where this theme has been, what, explored? But yeah, you're talking about like a large-scale war, like battles, death and stuff. And then you can think about the war between Sombra in the alternative future. Um, and you don't really see death over there as well. What you can do, perhaps, it's just an advice, is let them knock each other out. But that's shaky. You can also make Celestia or Luna, maybe Luna as kind of a rival thing between the sisters, think of a weapon that doesn't kill, but leaves the ponies incapacitated. Perhaps, yeah. What you can also do is, of course, go the diplomatic way, but that might be boring because you want action in a story. Maybe. Or not. But then I came up with an idea where uh, the crystal part becomes a message to a star like Luna. That might be a source of 
But that's cool. Yeah, yeah, because then we have a weak point. The weak point in Starlight's um, whole plan is this, the, the heart, the crystal heart. Because without the crystal heart, she can't do anything. So that will be the major strike point. Uh, what's also a very cool thing to do, uh, Tom Clancy sometimes does that, is create like a commando team who then infiltrates like spies maybe uh, the ranks of Starlight Glimmer and then tries to disable or destroy the crystal heart to render Starlight Glimmer powerless. Might be something you could do. Let's, let's think about that, okay? One more question. Well, I want to add to this. In a situation like this, if you think about politics, it's not uncommon for, say, like Riffenstone to offer support to Celestia and Duna, for example, and to, so that you don't need them to attack them, but they would just let them in as refugees. Yeah, because Oh, you have something to think about, sir. <laughs> you have an enormous challenge to face. I want to thank you all very much for doing the panel with me, because without you, my dear audience, I would be talking to myself all the time. Although, someone once told me that is actually a sign of intelligence. Of course, I also want to thank the volunteers here in the room, the volunteer behind the camera, and Galacon for letting me do another panel. If <laughs> thank you. If you have any more questions, or if you just want to have a friendly chat, I will be walking around the convention both tonight and tomorrow, so you can always tap me on the shoulder. I hope to see and hear from you all again, and I wish you a wonderful time at Galacon 2019. Thank you.